You know they say if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Nothing nice to say, but I'll go nice. I ain't got nothing, no, no, no. I ain't got nothing, I ain't got shit nice to say, I ain't got nothing nice to say at all. So I won't say nothing at all. <laughs> I ain't nothing nice. You hear me? I say, whoa, welcome to another midweek special edition of the Nothing Nice to Say interview series. This your man Aldo Nice. And I got with me, joining me, one half of the um internationally known hey. Black Packers movement. Yeah. My man, Mr. TP. I'm going to let you introduce yourself however you want to be introduced right for this podcast, man. All right. Well, thank you. First of all, shout out to Best Friend Weekend. Thank you to my big brother, Alpha, you know what I'm saying, having me on the show and um, just providing a platform where we can push what, what we represent and try to give something positive to the people. What the, what the, man, I couldn't have said it better myself. Man, so I, I just kind of threw it out there a little bit. And as you, um, as you guys are starting to listen to the podcast and everything, your first question is probably... Um, what, what's Black Packers? What's that all about, man? Tell me a little bit about something. I mean, all I know is y'all two young players adding something essential to the culture, yeah, showing man. our people the world from our perspective. Hashtag right. Black Packers. Right, hashtag right, right. Earth Hour Turf. Hashtag Complexion Protection. Yeah, Tell right. me a little bit of something about all of that, man. That's just the tagline, but you, you let me know what the movement about. So I feel like that's what it is in a capsule, but kind of the bigger theme and how we came about was just, um, I moved abroad after playing college football, um, where'd you move this broad to? Chill out. Oh, you oh you moved abroad. Like oh okay okay. <laughs> I moved a broad. Okay okay. Not a broad. <laughs> I moved overseas. Okay, I got you. I got you. I, you need to dumb it down for some some of the audience, but continue. Yeah, so I moved outside of the United States where I'm from. Um, but yeah, so uh, I played ball at University of Buffalo for three years. Transferred to Hampton University, the real HU. Um, in Virginia. Shots fired. Yeah, shots fired. Y'all know who it was intended for. And um, and then from there, I, I gave up my scholarship my last year. And then um, I moved to Guatemala. That was like the first opportunity I had. I kind of I always wanted to live abroad and I always wanted to learn Spanish. So, and I feel like y'all can't see this, but he's sitting right here next to me and I'm not making no eye contact. So I don't know how he felt about that. I'm just trying to concentrate. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if I get, you, like, we sitting right here in the room. I'm like, I can't even talk to this motherfucker for the whole two hours making eye contact. So I'm just going to concentrate and deliver this message. Just pretend like you're talking to somebody over here. Look, right. look I'm used to it. Yeah. I'm used to not talking to nobody. Right. Continue. So, um, so yeah, man, I um, gave up the scholarship, had like one more semester left in school. And I was like, well, shit, I always had a passion and I always found it easy to kind of teach and convey a message to people. And I could merge that with the desire to always want to live abroad and, you know what I'm saying, learn Spanish. So I was like, let me jump into a um, a TEFL program or like a TESL program to get a certificate. And there was one program that um you got your certificate and then they guarantee you a job placement overseas. And the only placement that really gave me a shot was in Guatemala. I didn't know anything about no Guatemala and shit. I was like, well, I'm, I'm so ready and so eager to do it. I don't care where it is. If the opportunity is there, I'm going to take it. And that was the only one I had. I actually had a couple schools and programs that were, some were Christian based or other just religion based or, you know, philanthropic. And they were like, shit, well, you're too black. And I'm like, well, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I'm I'm willing to volunteer my time and my energy. And you're telling me I don't fit the mode of your program because of the, the way that I look. And the program in Guatemala never, they never imposed that type of restriction on me just being the man that I am. So I went there and I took it. I was there for six months. Um, and, you know, it was just like a, a, a great experience. It really opened my eyes up to the world, but shit, I got broke. So then, <laughs> <laughs> which happened, right? You know, so in like my last little mini vacation while there, I met a cat who was living in Panama at the time. We exchanged um, contact on Facebook and I told him I'm going to go home, save some money. And then I want to move to Panama. So I did that, moved to Panama. And then that's where I met Javier. Um, Javier is the, the other co-founder of Black Packers. And um our our experience and our friendship, we both from we both from Texas, um, both African American guys. His father's Panamanian. Me, I'm just I'm just shit a light skinned nigga that it ain't nothing exotic nor special about me. My mama black. I just want you I just want you to yeah. let every light skinned person know that 
Cause that's a fact. Ain't nothing special it's or nothing. exotic about your life. It's not. Skin. And where I'd be a damn <laughs> I'm a damn lie running around talking about I'm mixed or something. You know what I'm saying? So I'm your regular light skinned black guy. And um our experience was kind of, you know, it, it was a it was a cool thing because it was like his experience was a little bit different than mine, but from my perspective, Guatemala has a black population, got even a population, but being in Panama, it's like, damn. Until I open my mouth, these people don't know that I'm not from here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that was kind of the initial experience I was looking for, but it wasn't available at that time. So then once I I got involved in the culture and I started seeing things that paralleled African-American culture back home, that kind of made real a lot of the things that I learned about like Marcus Garvey and just an international black presence and and how we can we could find unity and commonality amongst each other. And then from that basis and level of understanding, we should take it to the next level, next level, which is to actually build unity in more of a concrete and business way. I, I always say like, you know, if black people did like the Chinese do on a global level, we would be where we're supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? Instead of seeing each other as, oh, I'm from this part of the world or this my flag or this... It's like, man, that's bullshit. You know what I'm saying? So um, the Black Packers idea just came from within living abroad, just um, another experience of being in hostels and being in these international settings as an African-American person from the United States, first of all, from the United States, um, and being kind of an anomaly. Like they know our sports figures. They know our artists. They know a lot of things about our culture and, and things that we make cool to the world, but they don't know us. Mm-hmm. And I saw that as a as an issue, but also as an opportunity to create a platform that encouraged more black people to travel abroad instead of just going to Miami and L.A. and New York City and Vegas. Like, that's cool, too. But shit, you you going to get it. You might be able to get a cheaper plane ticket and do twice as much in traveling abroad opposed to just going to South Beach. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, well, you know, let's let's do that. And then the backpacks came out of through traveling like. When I left Panama, I, we hit every country. My boy flew into Panama, and then we flew out of Mexico. And every country in between, we would like go on a little excursion for a day and be like, I'm trying to find a patch mm-hmm. of that country. And by the time I got back home, shit, from hand sewing the bag and accumulating all these patches, something that I bought that was just a basic army fatigue type of bag, by the time I got home, I was like, shit, I don't care what nobody else thinks. I think it's live. You know what I'm saying? If somebody came to me and was like, yo, would you buy this? I was like, hell yeah, I buy it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, okay, that's a that's an entrepreneurial, you know what I'm saying, little opportunity. And um, that's kind of like where the merchandising came from. And, you know, just black packers is spin on the word backpacker, which is an alternative way of traveling, but throwing our mix into it and our message, which is to get black folks to 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 see that more as an option instead of just staying at resorts and doing the whole you know, formalized, I guess you could say, travel experience. So um, just kind of listening to you there, I ask that question a lot when when I'm interviewing different people. I'll say, hey, look, tell me a little bit about what your company is. Tell me a little bit about your business. As you can tell, this guy knows um, very well, very, um, very certainly what you guys are trying to get into and what you what you really focused on right there. So you said a bunch. So I want to kind of unpack some of the things just a little bit because um, you talked about merchandise. You talked about the the whole origins of it. You talked about exactly what you guys are trying to do. So um, just a couple of questions I had there. So let me let me back up a little bit and ask this. Earth or turf? I'm curious. Is like what was that term mean? Um, for one, just man, going back, it's one race, the human race, mm-hmm. and the origins of that family of our human family is is the black man and the black woman. And we inhabited every part of the earth first. Mm-hmm. And I find it just kind of ironic that, you know, you travel somewhere and, and a lot of times people don't even necessarily understand or appreciate the history of where their ancestors came from. Like I went to Malaysia and I had already learned a bit about like the original man and woman of Southeastern Asia, which is definitely an African person. That just happened to get on a boat and go over there first on their own free will, not on no damn slave ship. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So when I say Earth or Turf, it's kind of like, you know, a lot of times in the states or in the countries where we come from, we're not appreciated. Mm-hmm. We're exploited and we're used, and we don't we don't truly we don't truly understand what we represent and and what we give to the world. So. And saying Earth or Turf is like shit. Anywhere I go, I feel home. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And I mean, I, I like that. I like that that whole uh, the whole ideology. And the other the other hashtag y'all throwing there is complexion protection. So kind of complexion protection, kind of a funny thing. So like, I remember in Panama, the area I stayed in was kind of a nice area. And I remember one day I got stopped in the morning by a police. And what they would do is they would stop you 
And as soon as you show American passport and play dumb, like you don't speak mm-hmm. Spanish and oh, I just speak English, then it's no problem because you're not one of the black people from here that we really don't. Okay, fuck so with. when I went to Panama, I, they were telling me like right off top, it was like Canelo, Moreno, it was like different, yeah. different, like a whole like kind of the same. It felt like the same way that you right. would marginalize or basically identify black people in America, like light skin, dark skin, whatever, right. and they had different opinions based yeah. upon that shade of black. Yeah, it's that 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 colorism concept is in has its own you know uh, nuances here or there but to me in my opinion i think it's just a divide and conquer Mm -hmm. tactic that was imposed by all of these different european colonizers and all of their systems and i think even more so in latin america because you have um the numbers were so lopsided in a lot of places in latin america the amount of african descended people compared to european descended people was more comparable to like a Geechee land in South Carolina yeah. or or somewhere where it was extreme. So for them to be able to survive in that dominant position, they had to do things to divide and conquer up amongst the Africans themselves by saying, well, oh, you know, if you're the descendant of the European man and an African woman and your complexion is different and your hair texture is different, then we're going to place you at a higher standard and uh, not a higher standard, but a higher status within the society. So, but, but complexion protection is just like shit. In the same way somebody would look at black skin and brown skin and say, oh, that's bad. To me, I think it's just a mental thing. If they say it's bad, they didn't got power over me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? My power come from how I define myself and my reality and me acting on that and living on that. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like another thing that to to make what we what we are, you know what I'm saying? Like ain't hiding and shit. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. My wife got me darker than me. Right. There you go. <laughs> we, we, we've had many a conversations on the podcast about that, about just um, yeah. kind of that that whole idea of of, of having a mate that's a, a certain complexion compared to yours. But um, let me let me just talk a little bit more about. Um, I, I pulled up the website, so I was doing some doing my due diligence, and I saw Javier. I think the first time I met Javier was um, a couple of months ago when we were when we were in um, in Cyprus by Tim. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he, he had a lot of thoughts about different things, about um, just kind of the Afro-Latina experience um, and just kind of how that compared. And he was talking about sports and different things. So I saw y'all had a, a bunch of things on the website. Specifically, um, I, one of the things I thought was really good, so y'all should go check this out, blackpackers.com. Um, and we'll say it again. We'll say it probably a few times throughout this interview. But it's how to travel, you know, basically for Negroids, you know, how niggas don't go nowhere. You got to tell them how to travel. I'm going to tell y'all a little story right quick. One, um, When we went to Panama, uh, shout out, I, I, I went out there with my partner, the Harry, and uh, my cousin, Ash Dog, and we was going to meet, we was going to meet, we was going to meet uh, Graham. So we pull up to the, to we went to Miami and then we caught a connect and we got to Panama. And when we got there, they wouldn't let Ashley in the, in the country. And they was like, basically, now nah, you don't have 30 days of passport validity. And they was like, yeah, your passport is not expired, but you need to have an extra like 90 days or something. I might have been yeah. 90 days. Yeah. And they were like, you can't come in our country. So they basically held him at the airport. We was trying to give people money. We was trying to do what we could do. They was like, nah, you can't do nothing about that. So they turned him around, put him back on the plane and sent his ass back to America. <laughs> like, like he had, a, you know, you made it all the way here. Now you got to go back, right? So um, just kind of one of those things. And I thought about it. I was like, how many times do we um, do people try to do something different? They try to step out of themselves and say, let me have this a different experience. And then you get there and you don't really know how to do it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a very valuable asset. I think it's 7.6, 7 points 7 point y'all put on there as far as things to consider, mm-hmm. things to really think about before you go. So that's something y'all might want to check out before you do some international travel on blackpackers.com. But also, I saw you guys got um, blog posts. Mm-hmm. Um, so is that both of you guys doing it or is it one or the other? How does that, how does that work? Man, I'm in law school. And I ain't got time to really do nothing except for I do I handle mm-hmm. most of the merchandising. Um, gotcha. Javier, he's also he's in in doctoral he's in a doctoral program at University of Texas at Austin, but you know he's more geared at writing and creating content that kind of goes into that doctoral mode. You know what I mean? Yeah. Introspective and bringing new ideas and challenging thought versus me. I'm in there trying to learn down code book stuff like that. <laughs> I was doing I was doing more of that. Um, I say before I started school. But for the most part, that's his thing. Okay. I mean, okay, so let me just ask you this. You talked a little bit. You said something about Malaysia. You said something about Gua- Guatemala. Guatemala, Guatemala. You said something about Panama. Mm-hmm. What other countries have you been to? Where's your international travel consisted of at this point? Um, at this point, man, I've been everywhere from from Mexico all the way down to Colombia. Um, I've been to Puerto Rico, DR, um, 
We didn't get to make it to Haiti. Ran out of time. But um, Jamaica, St. Thomas, just pretty much the Caribbean mm-hmm. and then all of Central America um, with the exclusion of El Salvador. El Salvador was hot at the time. Yeah. And it was kind of out the it way. Was kinda, so yeah, I was I like, you. maybe that's right on time. Maybe just, maybe you don't need to go get uh, nah. um, MS-13 dub. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not right now. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Now that's stereotypical. Let me take yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but shout out, but shout out to El Salvador. You know what I'm saying? I got a lot of friends here, especially in Houston, who are El Salvadorian and they're great people. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But we all know, you know, politics, politics, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there you go. So um some of kept, let me know some of your experiences. Like what are like some things that you really took away from like some international travel that you might want to share with people? Um you don't have to say a bunch. Just something that sticks out in the mind, in your mind, Man, and nothing. What, and keep it PG, because I don't know who listening to this. I don't want to hear no, yeah, yeah, no, no wild no. parties, nah, and, nah, um, nah, nah. In, in some in some <laughs> ignorant country somewhere. Nah, we I don't have time no. for it. We're definitely gonna keep it PG. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I say, man, just like as far as you know, in the line of what what I'm here for and what I'm supposed to, what I feel like is is uh, on my heart, and as far as my message. It's just kind of like the the common circumstance of black folks everywhere that I've been. Like, even when I go to Jamaica, yeah, you have affluent African-American or African people. But at the same time, it's like, dog, everywhere I go, when I go to the majority black part of that country or that city, it's a damn hood. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And the people who own the businesses in that damn neighborhood is not us. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And when I'm going and I'm looking at the elite, and the people who call in shots in that country, whether it be politicians or big business, it ain't us. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, we all, especially over here in this Western world, we all have a common um, history of like slavery. You know what I'm saying? And the legacy that that created economically. See, like, that's my thing. And I know in one of our last conversations at at, um, at Tim House was, you know, talking about a lot of people getting conscious now, but they just on some rah-rah type shit. <laughs> or I'm on some... Red, black, and green army fatigue. You know what I'm saying? Like, you I, got a red, black, and green tattoo, no, no, and you no. got army fatigue backpacks. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> no, I, I'm definitely gonna do that too. <laughs> but I'm not gonna limit. I got you. You know, it's what not I just. Re- it's just not just what's on the the surface exactly, level. Exactly. Exactly. Because I meet a lot of black folks who are in all different types of career paths. But unless you had that conversation with them. They not just going to come off the rip and be like, ah, man, you know, the white man is the devil type shit. It ain't even about that. You feel me? But when you get down to what that person does and what they represent, they all for what Marcus Garvey stood for. You know what I'm saying? All for what Malcolm X stood for, yeah. which is, to me, it's bigger than just a bunch of rah-rah. So how is, you know, in an international context, it's just like somebody got to say something and somebody got to do something. And I see a lot of times like us as African-American people or black folks in parts of the world where we have access to capital and we had the ability to be able to create capital. I feel like a goal that I have just speaking personally is to learn business, is to learn entrepreneurship, is to, to, to learn trade, import, export, and then be able to facilitate economies in other parts of the world. And right here in the States where black people are economically getting our fucking ass kicked. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's like the main thing for me that I would say is like, you know, it's common, like, it don't matter. You could be in the States. You could be in Jamaica. You could be in Panama. You could be in fucking Puerto Rico, DR. It don't matter. The majority black, we hurting economically. You know what I'm saying? So that was actually the next question I was going to ask. What is it like being black in different places? And I mean, you, you've already kind of touched on that. Um, I mean, it's something I, when you were talking about it, I just remember that same thing when we went out there for Carnival and it was just like, shut up. Like, just keep your mouth closed and you look like everybody else. Right. You're kind of part of the culture and you're going to get treated a certain way because they think you're, you know, part of that culture. Yeah. We look no different. And it's, it's interesting. I'm not, I can't say that about we as in everybody, but I can say this. Black people all across the United States, you got somewhere that if you go, that you're going to look just like them people. Absolutely. Like you, black people could go find home somewhere else besides America where everybody's going to fuck for, I mean, for me and my complexion, a lot of, like in Panama seemed like it might have been it. Yeah. The way they was, the way they was talking <laughs> to me, like they was like, nah, you want us. Yeah. Sure. So uh, in the Dominican, they say the same kind of thing, but you know, even if you're a crispy brother, you take your ass to Ghana somewhere. You'll find yeah. you'll find your people somewhere. <laughs> That's not a big thing. So, I mean, you talked about your goals as far as kind of um, kind of bringing a bringing some bringing culture around and kind of maybe uplifting the the, the plight 
of African of African people, of people of the diaspora all over the world, uh-huh. like however that may be. Um, but let, let's I'm gonna bring it back down to a little bit more capitalistic thing. You did talk about um, your merch. You talked about your your bags. Mm-hmm. Um, so what's like some of your goals with that? Like, is that just kind of a hey, we do this, whatever, or do you really want to have a Black Packer brand as well? I feel like that's what it started. It just is just as like okay, well let me let me see if. If I can make this, and then two, let me see if people are going to like it. Okay. And then I feel like just in the last two years of doing that and using social media as a platform for entertainment, but also as a platform for business, you know, if you have the ability to reach out to people you never met in person, they don't know you from Tom, Dick, or Harry, but they can find your product and be impressed by it and actually go and consume the product and spend money with you. It just makes sense. Like, why not do it? You know what I mean? And then- on my end, like the backpack, that's something. Whenever I travel, I take a backpack and a duffel bag, and I'm out. I yeah. don't check bags. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's a utility thing as well. Um, but as far as goals, I feel like now we've hit a point where we know that the product is fire. We know that people like Shit, it. All right. But go ahead. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that's a lot coming Negro. from my boy, too. I want to let y'all know. Negroes will hate. Yeah, right? So, um... But um, I think now is is just the next point, the natural progression, which is to to get more organized with the business. So mm-hmm. we got our paperwork and things like that in order, and now it's actually hit a point where it's like I can't allow a middleman and their business decisions to be able to cut off the flow of mm-hmm. my product and my access to a product that I take and flip it and do something else with it. So now I've been reaching out and talking to people through um. Like Alibaba and different, you know what I'm saying, international <laughs> sites. Mm-hmm. But And I know that somebody told me, he's like, man, if you send the Chinese to produce your shit, they're going to bootleg your shit. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, yeah. but but everything has been trial and error to a certain extent. So it's just like stepping it up to the next level. I'm going to keep doing the same thing or I'm going to try to scale it up. So now it's just like finding more people on the internet who who give out that information about how to scale your business and how to really formalize and, and game plan stuff. And and I say, man, for the next, the past two years, it was launching the idea and trial and error. And now it's at a point where, okay, I know it's fine. Let me take the next step and, and create it. Like I used to say, a real business out of this shit instead of just being kind of like more of a passion project that I gotcha. just work on and sell it to people here and there. Well, I think it's, it's an interesting thing because I can only, I can speak to um, the experience that I've had um, kind of growing the Best Friend Weekend brand about how everything we do seems to start with one thing. And it's like, and it seems like um, fashion or necessary or merchandise is never really the play. Yeah. It's never the play. Yeah. Like you didn't start Black Packers saying, hey, I want to make Black Packers t-shirts. Right, right. And um, what I think is funny is like I have a Black Packers t-shirt, right? A t-shirt is kind of like the thing that everybody, you have to have because everybody likes like, I guess wants a t-shirt, yeah. but it's the last thing that I ever wanted to do was make a t-shirt. Right. So, I mean, if you see the Best Friend Weekend brand, most of the things we do are kind of like dad hats or some beanies or whatever. We went with the hats thing. But even outside of hats, I would have um, really liked to, and we got we got some things up in the works. Um, actually, we're going to probably, we're going to try to partner with, um, with Black Packers to do some things, but sure. in regards to um, bags, I just think that that's a dope idea because... I mean, as the, shout out my guys in college, man. They used, we used to call ourselves the backpack clique. Everywhere we went, it was backpacks. It was backpacks down. Keep all of your stuff twenty four seven at the party. Everybody pulling up with backpacks. Yeah. So when I was like, oh, backpackers, that's right up my alley. You look around this crib, I got hundreds of backpacks, just yeah. different types and whatever. I was about to start sewing um, patches on them, but I was like, nah, that's a little swagger jack and a little bit. So I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna have to get with you about making, um, about getting patches done because I see y'all have a lot of y'all own patches that y'all get yeah. manufactured somewhere and y'all putting your own patches on there. So I think that that's pretty cool um, with the merch. I'm saying that, man, look, when y'all see it, you're gonna want one. Now, the price point is, and you, we had this conversation about the price point once. Yeah. I don't own a backpack yet. And, and honestly, you can say this because. Dude's not being a really good supporter of the homies business. And I, I don't look at myself that way. Nah, I look at I, myself I like I I'm gonna I'll get to it when I get to it. Yeah. But I you know, I intend to have a, yeah. a, a backpack, uh, a black packers backpack and I will have one soon enough. Yeah. I just like, hadn't sat down to say what I wanted, how man, I wanted to customize. Like, I wasn't going on a trip where I thought I needed so that kind the of the same thing you expressing right now is like we'll have a lot of people hit us up and be like, Yo, I'm really interested. And then in time, 
they come back and they buy one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So at first it was kind of like, man, I'm trying to make the sale, trying to make the sale. But then you realize that people are going to come back as long as you keep putting content out there yeah. and you keep showing improvement in the product and just in the creativity of it, then people are going to come back and say, you know what? That just confirms what I thought it was the first time when I reached out. So it's it's all good, man. But this this right here in and of itself, taking the time and allowing us to come on and be a part of what y'all doing, man, we appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know well, saying? definitely. So what I was saying about the price point thing was, you remember we had the debate yeah. because I was like, you're charging. I mean, the backpacks are going to range from 120 to 150 or something in that range. Starting, um, starting at 100. Starting at 100. Okay. Yeah. And and your my comment was like, can't you like loop people in at like 50 for the people who don't um like might not have the hundred whatever and people trying to get down and support but you're not giving them a, uh, an option at like 50 bucks 40 bucks to support you uh-huh. what are your thoughts on that i think that i think i think that i know the facts that for one african-american people in the united states are the 11th richest group of people on the whole entire planet if we were if african-american folks in the usa was a nation we would be richer than like hella fucking countries but it's just a matter of how do we perceive certain things? I understand, like, you know, like, I'm an internet business. You know what I'm saying? I'm an Instagram business in a sense. So A big cartel business. Yeah, I'm a big <laughs> cartel business. I'm a PayPal drop that link. You I'm know a, what I'm saying? I'm a cash out business. Type I'm a, of damn business. I'm a cash out $100 yeah, business. Straight up. <laughs> so that, that might, you know, raise a certain amount of speculation in people's head. But like I say, man, it just goes back to... Staying consistent, but like I have people hit me up and say, "Look, you know, for prime example, my partner just had a he just had his second his second child, and he was like, man, I want a diaper bag.' Exactly. So he was like, "Go get me a di- like make me a diaper bag with y'all patches on yeah. it." So I ended up buying a bag from China. It was like thirty five dollars or something plus the patches. You know what I'm saying? I'll figure out whatever my number is, but it'll be something well below a hundred dollars. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, um. There's there's alternatives, you know, and 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 then just as far as scaling anyway, like what what we've been doing is hyper custom in the sense of for a hundred dollars you could get one of our small bags that comes already with four patches and then a custom name strip just for that price. But when when somebody sees that compared to another bag we made that might have had ten extra patches put on it and that shit live, mm-hmm. then they're gonna be like, well. Man, I want that one, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I don't want to pay that much. Yeah, I got a hundred, but I want my shit to look like yeah. that for a hundred. But I'm like, I don't even charge them people nothing to put the patches on. I, they just pay for the extra cost of the patch. They might have spent fifty, sixty dollars in a patch, but I do want to create, and that's definitely something we're gonna do, is to create a product that's uniform, so that makes mass production easier. And that's, again, that's whoosh. just thinking in terms of scaling. Like, if I want to make this shit a Jan Sport. Or a Supreme backpack, or one of the other backpack brands that's big. Shout out East Pack. Yeah, East Pack. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Any one of them. I like, when you go into to to the damn. I'm looking at Charles. This Charles Willis. Charles, Charles Oakley. Man. Charles Oakley on here going hard on somebody on ESPN. Relax, man. <laughs> Back to the point though. Um, just in terms of scaling, um, you know, I I definitely want to create a product that's fire and that's appealing. But that can be sold a hundred units at a time, you know. So I mean, and I'm, I've kind of hit that in road sometime with uh, Best Friend Weekend. So uh, just out there, the, the the camo hats and the black and whites might be the only ones I'm distributing coming up real soon. Like when I make my re up orders, because it's kind of hard to have a whole bunch of different variety when you're sitting on inventory and everything like that. Now, you know, once again. I can speak to this and I know you can you can probably attest to the same thing. You could probably move way more backpacks and I could probably move way more units if we get out there and just be like if you have if we had the 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 free time Absolutely. to be to be out there kind of promoting your own yeah. thing. And it's just tough when you're working to, to to do both. Um but I guess my my counter was always like, "Hey, I'm going to keep the price point low to try to make sure that more people are able to get it." Yep. But then you you said you was like you want to support the business, well, then you can support me at this. You got the money to support this, yeah. so then support this. And I think that that makes sense as well. Yeah, and then I think I, I look at like the the industry of like real travel grade hiking, camping type backpacks. And man, like my bag at one for a 45 liter backpack, high quality with all of the bells and whistles that come with it compared to another brand. 
shit, you pay me 125 plus the extra patches, you're going to pay them folks maybe 250 265 with no patches yeah. and no swag. You're going to yeah. be in the airport looking like a damn... Yeah, Reggie. Line, you know, like some damn Reggie. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's a trade-off. But but then again, that comes to the credibility of a brand. When some people see certain things, like you look at now, a lot of the high designer brand shoes and clothes, and that shit is fucking ugly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But because of that name tag, they got that blue magic. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, like you know, that Pepsi, You're right. that... that, that, that Established. You put brand. a Supreme something on a on a wristband and it's one hundred twenty. Yeah. One hundred twenty dollar wristband. Yeah, People I saw I saw up. a keychain the other day. So I, I don't. It was it was an off white off white keychain yeah. and it was like two something. I'm like, what? It just said keychain. I mean, I mean, every. I mean, you know, that, that's part that's part of what it is. Once you get to a brand that's exclusive, but I'll say another thing too. Just in terms of like building and scaling business throughout this process, it's taught me so much about. Um, Basically, how you get from a point of doing all the work to outsourcing the work. Got you. So, I'm at a point now where it's like, mm-hmm. I want to outsource the work, but I don't want to lose that quality. I don't want to lose that creative Absolutely. Um, essence that I feel like if I've been doing it myself and it's been working and, and you're growing. Gonna lose some of the, and you're going to lose some of the revenue. Right. But you'll lose some per bag, but I would rather... my me, I rather I rather sell twenty thousand bags a month than twenty. Okay, yeah, of course. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Well, not even twenty thousand, but I mean, realistically, Duh, nigga. realistically <laughs> yeah, right? But realistically, I would rather sell fifty bags a month than sell five to ten bags a month, mm-hmm. but not have to sew everything myself, not have to order yeah. every. Your patch time is myself. worth my time is worth more than my money. Absolutely, in a lot in a lot of cases, um, when you you got to put a lot of sweat equity into your business when you're getting started, but it gets a point where it crusts over, right. where you're not sweat equity. Um, time at that point. At, mm-hmm. at a point, it's yeah. Let's start outsourcing. Let's start doing some other things. So you, you're definitely about uh, um, definitely right about that. Um, so this this is definitely something I def I wanted to talk about. Um, okay, so Black Packers. Um, I, I've done different different interviews with different people for the Nothing Nice to Say series. I've talked to to people who are doing different things, and I'm I'm gonna say this in a in a disparaging type of way. Just to kind of let you know, kind of how it came. Come on, Charlemagne. I'm, hey, man, I'm bringing it how, how <laughs> it go, man. So I would. Why come y'all don't let white folks? <laughs> uh, I know, is that what you mean? Hold on, hold on. I, I mean, come you, you, you could have called it. You could have called it the everybody. The all all Packers matter. Um, yeah. so no, no. Um, really, what I was gonna say is, I, I would typecast your movement as part of the um capitalizing on people feeling like they woke movement absolutely thing yeah but do you and, and i mean i guess i guess that's your thing do you feel like your brand is kind of tailored towards just that specific audience of natural hair i think i woke people uh-huh. talk to me I, and i hate saying that natural nah, hair nah, but nah. i mean you know what i mean no nah, but he's he's posing a very real question you know what i'm saying and even like i was joking saying well is is, is it only for black people like some of the first people to buy my bags with some of my white homeboys that I grew up with. Okay. And they just fucking Because everybody want to be a nigga, but nobody want to be a nigga. Absolutely. And they got a small part of them from elementary and middle school that if you, still if you wants put, to be a nigga. If, they, if, you, if you put a patch that said, my nigga, on it, they would buy it twice as much. Right. I'm, okay. But anyway, that's but an aside. Know, but, but just, you know, as far as the, the whole racial element of it, like, some of the first people to support me was my friends who happened to not be black. But they just saw what I'm doing and they wanted to 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 support it. Recently, I sold another bag to um to a couple like they they were younger. I think they might have been in high school or maybe you know early in college. Um, white kids, you know what I'm saying, and they just fuck with it. They yeah. like they like the swag of it. I think if you look at some other brands like a BlackBerry phone, you know what I'm saying, like was Blackberries <laughs> only made for black people. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? FUBU. Okay. It was a lot of people that wasn't black wearing FUBU, wearing okay. the shit out of some Fat Albert collection okay. back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And I think when it gets to a point where it's that respected, then it'll I'll see more people that aren't black buying in just because they fuck with the quality of the product and and how, how you know, how I guess how it make them feel or the utility of just having a backpack that looks cool in the airport or whatever it might be. Um, but your question was maybe tailored towards like the woke or the conscious yeah, and, and I mean, I had this same conversation. Well, part of it was the conversation I had with um when when I was talking to the Black Coffee Company. I was talking about 
all coffee matters. And it was that same kind of idea there. So that was part of the question. But more so, now now let's go let's let's progress to the other question. Okay. Which is you're not necessarily when you start talking about um, you know, the culture of black people in and around the world and how um black people should unite and and different things about economic freedoms amongst black people and things that we should do as a people globally and how we're all descended. Earth is our turf. We're all descended from Africans. Yeah. And then that feels like kind of all catchphrases and all terminology that speaks directly to, and, and I've said this on a podcast, you may not have heard this before, and I'm going to reiterate for those of you who might have not listened to that one, mm-hmm. that I look at it as a scale of wokeness, uh-huh. zero to 100, 50% meaning like I'm kind of on the fence, and I feel like most black people live in a healthy 50 to 80 percent range 51 sorry <laughs> shout out yeah uh, 51 to be real about yeah, 51 we're to 80 percent yet <laughs> fuck around get your foot cut off right some some black people live below it i mean yeah. it's they're all over um, and i say once you get past 80 percent, you kind of start getting into that whole tepian um wisdom which um that black israelite like some black people some israelite um like type of thinking so my point is are you on are you really focusing on kind of the woke black movement I feel and like, not just all black people. I feel like it's definitely for all black folks, but I'm going to slide some of that woke shit on, on your bag. Like I, be, I make a lot of bags for guys that play in the NFL and play in Canada, um, Canadian Football League, and I'm damn near every time they get a bag, it's going to have a kneeling Kaepernick with the fist. Oh, I saw you had Black Panther shit on some of them I'm going to put, you're going to get some of that because you never know when you... <laughs> Walking, finna go get on the jet, and ESPN got that camera on you. They need. I'm gonna I'm slide that message on there. You know what I'm saying? I have some people, and and a lot of a lot of guys I sell bags to. They might be married to to white women. Not to say that that makes them any type of any any less proud or any less um black than I am. I'm not saying that, but um just in the sense of it make, what does it make them? Then? It just make them a black person who happened to marry a non black person. Okay, you know what I'm saying. Hey, I still love you. I wish I had a camera pointed at his face (laughs) while he was talking. No, I'm saying, hey, I got the emoji with the hands up face. (laughs) Hey, you know what I'm saying? No, um, I heard, who did I hear say that? The only reason I'm thinking about it is because I heard um, Killer Killer Mike. Yeah. When he was on Charlemagne recently and he was like, you can't tell me nothing. Oh, he was like, don't tell me nothing about being black if you didn't marry a black woman. Yeah. And that's how he kind of, he came out the rip with that. And I think, I think it was Kanye he was taking a jab at, but. Just kind of making a point to say you can't like I'm not about to tell you nothing about an interracial relationship, yeah. Like because I don't know nothing about it, but don't tell me nothing about the black experience if you didn't marry a black woman. And I think he took it a little far because yeah, I think you can't say that because it's just a different type of black experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know? But but it's but to I think to more directly answer your question, um, it's geared at at all black folks. Um, I, some people I I I'd be kind of surprised when they like fuck with it maybe because Mm -hmm. they're more conservative in terms of looking at things through a racial lens um but for me i think that was also a part of and something that makes the 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 individualized patch element of the bag you know speak to what it actually is you know what i'm saying from the the big logo patch to the the three patches that come on every bag with it is if you wear that and you have to explain it to somebody you you know it's going to take you there. You're going to have to entertain that conversation. And, you know, to me, that's not a negative thing. Some people might not necessarily want to, but maybe this product isn't for them. Or maybe I'll make a product in the future that, that doesn't carry so many of those, of those messages, but might lead somebody to dig a little bit deeper and then find out truly what we represent. I think, you know, at I'm 28 now. So me at 23, I was like... With I'm with all the shit, and you're going to hear it every single time I talk. Versus now, it's like, I understand that everybody might not express their pride in, 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 in our ethnic group or our struggle as a people in the same way. Some of us have to be politicians. Some of us have to be police officers. Some of us have to fulfill these other roles to where they might not have um, they might not be in a position to say things in a certain way. Yeah, sometimes you got to keep your mouth closed, depending upon what you do. Right, and and I've I've definitely grown to understand and respect that more about people. But um, I think the the content of a person character will shine even through that. Even though they might have to be quiet at some point or another, they're still gonna make sure that a door gets open 
when there's an opportunity that they know would be good for us as black people. Or they might close the door when they feel like, yo, I'm not finna sit up here and just remain totally silent, but I don't have to go full blown Malcolm or Nation, so, Nation Islam. I, I, I was it. thinking about that um, before because I, I mean, I've, I've re- expressed that before that growing up, I always thought that, you know, Malcolm X was like the, the, that's, that's the, that's the black man you want. And even in college, he was like, that's the black, yeah, that's the, that's the prototypical because I think, and I've talked about this before once that there's an emerging, um, sense of blackness that takes place when you go to college. Especially when you go to HBCU, right, right. you're discovering things about yourself, you're discovering things about the culture, and you're proud, and you want to talk about it, mm-hmm. and you want to live it. So it was all like Malcolm X is that dude, uh, Martin Luther King was kind of kind of like, like a little chump. And then in, when you grow up, you realize, now nah, Malcolm X was talking that shit in New York, and Martin Luther King was living that shit in, in the <laughs> Birmingham, deep, in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama. Alabama. Right. It's a big With fucking strange difference. strange fruit on the trees. You, you can't you know really saying? just say all that bullshit when... The, the clan is next door, right? Like so, yeah. I mean, some in certain roles, but even still, whenever he really went there, oh yeah, he went there. Then they gonna go ahead and kill him, give him yeah. a holiday, and dumb down the message right. of really what his legacy had become. You know what I'm saying? So in 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 my in, in, the older I got, the more and more and more I respected the fact that Martin Luther King was that dude, Absolutely. like just period. Yeah. Um, and it's that same kind of thing. So I mean, I, I hate to to belabor another point, but I mean. I got a question, man. I always think this when I look at you, man. Why do um and and I guess I can use my mother as an excuse as a as an example as well. Like if you go to my mom's house, it's like she's got a whole bunch of like um, black Jesus and black angels and African drums and Kwanzaa reefs, um, like the Google Sabos. Yeah, <laughs> she lighted in you, bro. Um, yeah. So what's up with y'all light skinned people being the most Afrocentric people in the in the in the community, man? I, I speak. I mean, from my personal perspective, like I didn't grow up. Everybody got grandma house and your first cousins, right? That's in the trenches, right? Yeah. But I didn't grow up in the hood, per se. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I grew up and was the only little black boy in the advanced class in the upper middle class neighborhood. Okay. So for me, it was always Terry, well, speak for the rest of the black people. <laughs> you feel me? And I'm like, y'all got us fucked up. Like, my partners ain't dumb. They yeah. parents just ain't on their fucking ass the way my parents is on my ass that's making me be mm-hmm. in this class with y'all. And as dumb as you might think they are, or exceptional as you think I am, you're wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not an exceptional Negro. You know what I'm saying? Just because of my skin complexion and my facial features, I don't feel like I relate more to you than I do to them. I don't feel like I'm something. You don't feel like you're compensating any kind of way because but, of your lightness? I'm, 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 I feel like on a deeper subconscious level, like, yo, especially now, like more recently... Motherfuckers act like they never just met a light skinned black person before. Like it's some new shit. People be like dumbfounded, like, wow, you're really just black? I'm like, yeah. yes, motherfucker. Like we've been around a long ass time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, out of my brothers and sisters, I'm the lightest one. I got the most European facial features, but I got the nappiest hair. Got you. They brown skin and got you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Curly hair and shit. You know what I'm saying? Use the term curly hair. Right. <laughs> that shit is loosely curled. My shit tightly BDB curled up. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting because it's everywhere you go. Like, and I tell this to people all the time. When I lived in Louisiana, I was dark skinned. I mean, I bear I'm dark skinned. When I moved to Houston, is I I can't go nowhere without somebody being like light skinned. Like light skinned, really? That's what you right. see when you see me. Right. But I I just kind of I I've seen it in my mother. I've seen it with other people, and I just always think that that's an interesting phenomenon that. Lighter skinned black people seem to be a little bit more of the kind of beating the bells. And, and you whatever. know what? Another thing too is like people look at you, look at myself, and be like, "Oh, you light skinned. Those are those are features that are more desirable. Mm-hmm. So you should kind of want to distance yourself from black folks, got you. darker skinned mm-hmm. black people, because you're you're the you're the prototypical black. If you're gonna be black, we want you to look more like Steph Curry than Draymond. Well, yeah, I'm, or Barack Obama. Or we, Barack we had, Obama yeah. than 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 even his wife. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And it's like from our or well, from my perspective, it's just like nah, fuck that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? If you think that I'm this out of the third, then see me the same way you see all of them. Did you think that cats growing up around you looked at you like lesser or kind of like? Oh, this old light skinned nigga, he don't know the he don't know the whatever, and you felt like you had to compensate in that way. Like to be like, I gotta be more. 
No, but I mean, I've had a couple dark hey, skin brothers do... try me, and I slapped the dark shit out okay, of them. Okay, so let's 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 take that um that skin <laughs> complexion thing out of it because it's it's part of it. Yeah. But let's go back to the other thing you talked about because I think it may be major more germane to this conversation and more something that I can relate with. Do you think that your the fact that you were in the honors class and you was the that made you compensate a little bit more for blackness? Um. Yeah, because a lot of times I was put in a position where it's like even as a child, it's like, well, Terry, speak up for the rest yeah. of them. Mm-hmm. They're not here now. So when we're having these conversations about race and about history and things like that, I'm like, well, they can't speak because they're not in this classroom. But since I'm here, I'm not finished. And that, and I think another part of that is just like maybe what's in my DNA yeah. and like kind of like who my ancestors was. Like my dad is from the same county as Nat Turner. Okay. And grew up in the damn peanut field and the cotton field. You know what I'm saying? Literally in the same small itty bitty ass county. So part of that shit. I might be a damn reincarnate of not mm-hmm. not Nat, but just carrying that energy and that legacy. And my mom's side, like, we did DNA tests on her, but, I mean, not even going that far back. Like, her mom and them and that part of the family was awesome. Hey, I don't give a fuck about you burning that cross and shit. You're not finna come down here and just trample mm-hmm. all over us as a people. We mm-hmm. still stand for something. We still got dignity and God bless us with the same air in our lungs as mm-hmm. you got in yours. Like, who are you to, to play God with me? You know what I'm saying? And and, and um, I think that that led into from generation, my grandparents' generation of sharecropping and coming from the field, moving to the city. And then my parents' generation of being the first ones to go to college and the first ones to achieve like, you know, econ- uh, economic, a little bit of economic freedom, but just to get a taste of that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, to, and to be able to say, because my grandparents them was always like, you know, harped on that, like. You don't get your education, your ass going to jail. You're gonna yeah. be like your uncle. You know what I'm saying? And once you once they once you get that degree, can't nobody take it from you. You know what I'm saying? So I took that plus the Malcolm shit, and it's kind of like, yo, these motherfuckers just gonna get it. I don't know. I don't know no other. So way yeah, I mean, and, and what? And at the end of the day, you can really only speak for you. Yeah. And and that's what you're doing. Like your personal experiences, what brought you to um to where you are. One like you got a you got a bunch of tats. One of them that always stands out to me is the Trayvon Martin tattoo. Why'd you decide to get Trayvon tatted on you? Because I feel like um growing up too, it was like another thing where you sit in a class with these people and they'd be like, Oh, we're not like that, that's our grandparents. And I knew that that was bullshit even as a child. I remember I graduated in oh eight, high school in oh eight. And at that time, you know, you had the presidential election with boy, Barack Obama. Four kids, boy, a mortgage, my boy. <laughs> <Not good. laughs> but you're looking good, brother. You're doing good, brother. But um, but at that time, it was just like, oh, but we don't feel that way. It's not that. And I was like, man, y'all are full of shit. Yeah. Like, I remember one day, actually, a teacher getting mad at me, a so-called liberal white dude getting mad at me. Because I'm like, man, you're in here bullshitting. Like, I know you're full of shit. You know what I'm saying? You racist right now, yeah. motherfucker. Like, I know you don't feel that way. Y'all going to put that man in office and hang him. And that's exactly what they did. You know what I'm saying? They they castrated his ability to become a greater president as he could become by just vetoing and, and just shitting on everything that he did, regardless of and how much sense he made. And putting the ultimate races right after him and letting him repeal and try to and replace everything that he and did. And I feel like that was exactly what it was supposed to do because it just exposed the fact that these people, a lot of times, a white supremacist, you know what I'm saying, European and United States of America, they don't give a damn about us in the same way that they great grandparents didn't give a shit about us in Jim Crow segregation. This mm-hmm. is Jim Crow 2.0. So when I saw a child, Trayvon Martin, get murdered by a person disrespecting, disobeying, you know, uh, legal orders, telling him don't even get out of the car and don't do shit. And then that man, a grown ass man, go and kill somebody else's kid. And you got people who have children and have families and they choose race over just goddamn right and wrong. It's like, man, who am I to sit up here and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna keep playing dumb with y'all. You know what I'm saying? I so I, I, I got Trayvon on me because I feel like he was, he like the Emmett Till of our generation. You know what I'm saying? He was like maybe one of the people who you know got assassinated or something like that back in the day that kind of kicked black folks into another way of thinking. You know, and kind of woke us up in a sense. And I feel like with Trayvon and that whole saga, that was a catalyst of a lot of the things now where people are. Every one of these politicians that comes to a black platform or goes up there and want to holler about some minority this and minority that, we like, but wait a minute, what you going to do for the descendants of slaves, us specifically as African-Americans who are entitled to reparations? What do you think about that? And I think you look at a person like Bernie Sanders, who's supposed to be super duper liberal, but every time he get asked about reparations, this man literally gets mad. Mm-hmm. But it's like, aren't you Jewish? 
Did you hear um today? Uh, what's his name? Juli- Julian Castro. Oh, he was he was talking on CNN and he said, if under the Constitution we compensate people because we take their property, why wouldn't we compensate people who were actually property? Like, I mean, hell, I might I might have to get behind old buddy right now. That sounds like some yeah. Shit. And, and and I think you know, and I don't know how. To me, it's on topic because it's mm-hmm. it's commonality shit. If we can talk about black people on a global level, we all entitled to some form of re- economic restitution because that's that's at the core of all these other problems you see. You know what I'm saying? I live in third world. You got drugs. You got guns. You got violence. You got prostitution. You got fucking desperation, homelessness, mental illness. You got all these other things. Why come we don't see these same levels of dysfunction in other ethnic communities? Because mm-hmm. they ain't going through the economic shit that we going through. You okay. know what I'm saying? They got a a frame of mind and an economic base that allows them to support themselves and have a net, a support net for the for the people who might be struggling within the, within their economy. You know what I'm saying? And even as far as like a lot of immigration and things, people come here, they they'll accept working for you know less than minimum wage because they're sending that money back to their country where that money is doubling and tripling. And they like, okay, well, I come have a kid yeah. here. My kid get the education. I send that money back home and build a whole fucking town. Yeah. And start three, four businesses back the, home. The dollar goes way further, or the money you're making here right. goes way further outside of here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of things there. And I mean, I guess, and I guess when when we think about Trayvon, and I was I was googling, doing a little googling about Zimmerman, because I guess I never really understood what race Zimmerman was until just now that I googled it. That he's you know half white, half Peruvian. Is what it is. But I mean, it kind of, um, the way the structure, the power structure is set up in the United States, it's like people come here and if you're not black, you feel like you're better than black. It's a it doesn't matter system. what you are. It's a caste system for sure. We got a racial hierarchy and caste system. And I think that plays a lot into what we were talking about earlier with the light skin, dark skin thing. Mm-hmm. It's like that's being given more attention now because it's like you're dealing with a group of people as blacks who a lot of us don't see value in each other. We don't see beauty in each other. We don't see anything too positive in one another. So it's like now that it's accepted for me to run outside of my race and go marry someone else. Not because that's who God made for me and that's the natural who I'm supposed to love, but because that's a way for me to advance myself above the rest of these black folks Mm -hmm. that I really don't want to be a part of. Then, you know, that's that's a possibility. But man, a majority of people who come over here, they paperwork say white. Yeah. So you play all them games you want to. And especially I've been to your country. I didn't see how you treat the people that look more like me in your country. Yeah. So when you come here and you hollering about minority and getting all the benefits that really supposed to go to us. Yeah. Come no, on, I mean, it's, I'm kind of looking at you with the side eye because I'm like, you don't really give a shit about us. You don't give a shit about the black people in your own country. Well, I mean, I see that all the time. There's a um, there's a professor at our school who talks a lot about he's all he's always concerned about the the getting um, like Chicano Mexican American students into school. He's like, I'm not worried about. Um, Argentinians. I'm not worried about these other people. He's like, because they're coming from money, they're coming from wealth, they're coming from these other places, and then they come to the United States and they're like, oh, we got these minority students at our school. Right. When in actuality, that's not what what would what was intended. Right. To say like these minority um scholarships yeah. and different things. I that think happened. politically, um, one of the one of the things that I'm gonna push for as a future attorney. And, and what and and I want you to talk a little bit about that. You can expound as you talk. Tell us what kind of law you're trying to do and what. What you're in law school for? I mean, I know it's because you like to argue, so they sent that bitch to law school. <laughs> Preach, <laughs> right? I always felt like I was good. Like, so I light anybody else up if I, if I got something I, you know, I'm really passionate about. Um, uh, I want to do real estate law. You know, okay. Real estate has made the most millionaires. Re- real estate is real. It's a way that you can create generational wealth. Um, everybody need a place to stay. So I want to do things like own title companies, which is essential if you're going to buy a piece of property. Um, and then just be an investor um, and to be able to leave a legacy. If anything happened to me, then, you know, my, my children will be able to reap the benefit of, of that rental income or, or just of, of the appreciation of those properties that I buy. So that and then also um, like civil rights law. But one thing I'm not is like I'm not finna be out this motherfucker broke. And that's what we was talking about earlier, like nigga, fuck capitalism. That shit. That's what you know what that's what separates like, you from a hotel. Yeah, like fuck that. I ain't finna be out here running around, fight the power, fight the power, fight the power, man. If you ain't got your dollars right, that shit is just a bunch of jargon. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not for that. Like I want to have some concrete and real. And that's why I say again, if we pattern ourselves after the Chinese and take things we like and things that are work and leave some of the things that won't work, we'll be straight. 
And I think we're turning that corner as a people of seeing, man, we just need to own businesses and spend money together and, and take pride in that and put, put that shit first. You know what I'm saying? How do you intend to, to put that dollar back into the community? Because I heard you saying that for every backpack you sell, $3 is going to the educational experiences. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that at all. But um, we, we actually do. We sponsor um, a soccer club in Panama. Okay. Um, a young guy who is... I mean, Andres is young. Andres is probably not even 20 years old yet, and he's already in charge of, like, three different age groups of soccer clubs. Who like go AAU out. type. Yeah, like an AAU equivalent to kind of like an AAU program, and he's just he's a leader, you know what I'm saying, within this community, so we um we sponsor him. Um, but, I mean, shit, I want to own hostels and hotels and, you know what I'm saying, and be able to own different businesses and build different schools and just do a whole bunch of shit that without money... You either gonna have to kiss ass or motherfucking water down your message to get that type of funding. Whereas if I if I go about going out here and getting these legal millions of dollars, I can do what I want to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't really have to be held by the nuts as far as what my message is gonna then be you can and gift, who I'm gonna speak up. That for. money and you can make it right. make it work for you in, in those type of ways. Yeah. And it makes a bunch of sense, um, just as far as kind of redistributing wealth in that in that kind of way. Um so we did talk we didn't talk about this at all, but it's an interesting side story. The way I know you is because um, we could say a bunch of things. We know some of the same people, but the real the real way I met you was because you actually started teaching at the school I used to teach at afterwards. Do you feel like you gave some of these uh, messages that oh, you were trying to put out here to yeah. the kids? Hell yeah, man. I tell I used to tell people all the time that I taught math. I mean, I taught life with math as a backdrop. Absolutely. I got to go in here and teach y'all this shit about this tax test and star exam and these standardized tests. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I feel like the message that God put on me is bigger than that. Yeah. We're going to do that and you're going to thrive and succeed and go way beyond what they think you can do because of your ethnic group or the side of town you come from or the school district that you go to. But aside from that, I want to try to impart something on you to where even if you're not black, you'll look and you'll have me in your mind and say, well, I'm not going to feed into that racist shit because I remember Mr. Pete and I remember Mr. Terry was... You know what I'm saying? When I was going through crazy shit at home, like some shit I wouldn't even speak on right now on this, but things that kids go through, this was the person who made sure I got home safely. Or this was the person that only man I could confide in to tell me about what other people in my family, how they was violating me and and doing things to me as a child, you know, boys and girls that was just foul. You know what I'm saying? And, And I feel like, you know, teaching, especially teaching children, is something that's good for your heart. If you go at it with the right intentions, because children are children. So I'm going to talk. I'm going to teach them when we get to learning geometry and we talking about pyramids, about Khufu and about his three sons. And that's the origins of a lot of these science and a lot of these things that we come to know as just um, isosceles and all these, you know, people Galileo like to say cause you talk math like me and people like to say that math is um, culturally neutral, as in that you don't have to put in talk about culture at all to teach math. Um, a a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Regardless, if you talking about it in the context of this or that or the third, but I, I would definitely argue what you just said that math has context because there's a lot of things that's well, and even even from a sense of how you teach people culturally makes right. a difference. Like you don't teach a kid from a certain culture the way you teach kids from another culture. And I heard this the other day. Someone was talking about Asian kids are good in math. I mean, that's a, definitely a stereotype. That's definitely a uh, a thing that people believe, but it's not true. It's just the way we teach math is geared towards oh, yeah. the way Asian kids are right. are reared in the household, the majority of Asian kids. Even when you talk about your pedagogy, mm-hmm. look, if I got me a little black kid, I know he growing up in a rough ass apartment complex in the neighborhood and he exposed to all type of shit way before yeah. a child his age. Person, I'm going to talk to him. Hey, man, come sit your ass down. Exactly. Stop. Stop. around. Yeah. And do this damn work. These people look at you like you stupid. You ain't no damn coon. Yeah. Sit down and do your Boy, work. Boy, sit your ass down. Come here. Right. You feel me? And he going to look at me with the big eyes. Damn, this motherfucker talking to me in my yeah. language. And you know what? I feel him. Yeah. So I'm going to sit up here. I'm going to take a little bit more pride in myself. I'm going to do it. The same thing I speak Spanish. I'm going to talk to the Hispanic Yeah, kids. I was about hey. to do this whole um, interview in Spanish. Um, if, y'all, <laughs> if you press your SAP button right, right. on your shit, you can yes. listen to this whole interview in Spanish. Yeah, we did a tape over on that. <laughs> but, um, but you know, you got you to gotta meet people where they are. Yeah. And you got to speak to them in their language. Um, and then another thing, too, is just like I used to always ask. I ask grown folks and children this. 
but tell me three things you know about about blackness, about mm-hmm. what it is to be black before slavery, before the civil rights movement, and can't nobody tell you shit. Yeah. And it's like that plays into the psyche of a person. If I'm Asian and I'm told that I'm smart my whole life, yeah. I gotta go against the grain to go be a fuck up. <laughs> Versus if I'm black and everybody constantly telling me how fucked up I am, and I, I, to be to be opposite of that, I gotta I gotta go against the grain to be normal, to be yeah. regular. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I definitely I'm I'm here to teach math, but it's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. No, I mean, and, and that makes a bunch of sense. And something you said there that I, I really I really latch on to, and I think it, you said ed, teaching is good for you, good for your soul, or good for the heart. I don't remember exactly how yeah. you said it, but um, I think that teaching is also a young man sport. Yeah, I think when you get out of college, when you're like 22, 23, that's like when you build those best relationships. By the time you get to be about 27, 28, you've learned kind of how to teach and you can still build those relationships. But by the time you get to be closer to 40, it's kind of like let, let you should be doing something different mm-hmm. because I think that you still have to be able to. Now, some people do have an uncanny ability to relate with kids throughout their lives. Mm-hmm. But once you kind of leave out of that that environment where you don't really relate with the kids anymore, it's not time to it teach It can also you. become something just about a check, too. Yeah. I know I'm going to come here. I, I, I taught this lesson 12 years in a row. And I'm teaching it the exact same I'm way. I'm teaching the exact same way. If you don't want to learn, you don't want to listen, I ain't finna deal with your little badass. Mm-hmm. Here's the principle. You go out in the hallway versus when you young and you hungry and you taking every day like dead fucking mm-hmm. serious mm-hmm. and as a critical point, that translate directly to that kid like how you say some people they they never lose that fire but some people they can lose that fire and they become absolutely you kind of zombies it. within the system who just like look i'm gonna do my part yeah you know they I be passionate I about the things kids. they're passionate about some of them are passionate about coaching at the same time or some might be passionate about doing other things within education but not necessarily the kids in that way but i mean i don't want to get on too much of a soapbox on that um you talked a little bit about relating with kids for the rest of their life i just kind of want to throw this in there because we pushing up on it, but I got like one or two things I want to talk about. But since um, you just talked about relating with kids when you get older in life, I noticed on y'all November 22nd post on the Black Packers page, y'all were at the um, Hollywood Walk of Fame star of Michael Jackson. He related with kids for um, a long time. Are you one of those? Um... <laughs> this motherfucker just hollered about Michael Jackson. Are you one of them Let's black people who feel like they come in at the black man via Michael Jackson slash R. Kelly right now and Harvey Weinstein was doing it and, and Woody Allen was doing it while y'all not after them. Where do you stand in this whole I'm conversation like a, that's happening right now? I'm a right is right, wrong is wrong type of nigga, but I'm not a Kevin Gates, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> like I'm not naive. Like Robert, your ass is out of line, Robert. I'm not finna stamp it. I got a little sister, I got nieces. God willing, maybe one day I have a daughter. Robert, you're not getting a pass. You need to leave them fucking little girls alone. Right? <laughs> nigga, see a hot little girl, that nigga just... You get excited. That nigga get excited. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, Robert, I need to go put your ass down there in general population. Now, how you... stupid would I be? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, yeah. I don't know yeah. how smart you are. But so, right you know, is right. Okay. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Um, With Mike, I didn't, I didn't see the most recent documentary or whatever but i mean you're from earth right I'm from you've earth. heard of michael jackson right earth is your I, I, turf it's my turf did you you Yours and too. you you and okay just like it was kind of like uh, like nobody like you didn't have to watch the r kelly documentary to know r kelly was fucking around with little girls because no. everybody knew that yeah before you haven't watched the most recent michael jack but you know michael jackson was sleeping in the bed yeah. with little boys and that shit is like weird you know what i'm saying but i think what why do we are so quick to stop at that's weird and not that that's fucking criminal and because I don't. I'm gonna and, be honest with you. R. Kelly, I feel like R. Kelly was fucking with them little girls. R. Kelly was definitely fucking them little girls. Not fucking so, with them, he was knocking them little girls off. <laughs> right. So R. Knocking Kelly ain't getting no like that's fucked up. Like no, R. Kelly, you're fucked up. But Mike, I think Mike was just like a fucking. I don't know. I don't think Mike was fucking violating them little childrens. I feel like shit was weird. I'm damn sure not letting my kid go over your house fucking sleep in the bed with your ass. I think you could have fucked on Elizabeth Taylor. Okay, well let's just stop here. Let's not get into the, to the gritty details mm-hmm. of it because I got the way I think about it. I think about it that Michael Jackson ain't never had no real relationship with no woman his whole life. So clearly, I feel like he was a, a pedophile, 
and I are or if he wasn't but a pedophile, you know, he was kind. He's weird. He's not. People don't go through their life just being asexual for fifty years. He was doing something, and if them little boys was in there and he was just beating that wood while they was laying on the other side of the bed sleeping or whatever it might have been, who knows? Or or like those boys say, it was more. Who knows? He was doing some wrong shit. My real question is, where do you stand in, as far as where do you think black people should be standing on this? Do you think black people should be outraged that they're going after our black legends? Or do you think black people should be of the right is right, wrong is wrong, them boys shouldn't have been doing it, whatever. So I feel, I feel like it's a, I feel like it should be a combination of both of those things because when you look at historically, whenever we do some shit, the consequences is way more grave yeah. versus when other people do shit, it's a lot more understanding or brush it under the rug. But, um, I mean, when you, like right now, it's a big push to like make pedophilia normal. Hmm. And that shit ain't really getting talked about, but motherfuckers is trying to push like pedophile as a sexual preference, hmm. which is fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Like, a child is is the is is some divine shit. You know what I'm saying? Like the closest thing to to God, in my opinion, is 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 a fucking child with an untampered mind. You know what I'm saying? Like that's some pure type of shit. And that's like kind of going back to what I was saying about teaching good for the soul because you encounter that. You know what I'm saying? And you have ability to either help them foster that, or you had ability to to fuck that up. You know what I mean? And to, and to put negativity in that child mind. So when they come in with this whole pedophilia shit. It is. It's like okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna hang the black man before we make it cool. Yeah. But then at the same time, Robert, you shouldn't have been fucking with them little kids. Yeah. Like I'm not gonna stamp you or the people who trying to push it, but don't have royalties and 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 records and and ownership over nothing. You know, I feel like w- with the Michael Jackson shit, especially since that shit was already adjudicated, meaning it already went to court, and they already found that motherfuckers was trying to just basically extort that man for money. Then it's like. That is a play to to destroy that man's fucking legacy financially, aside from just what pop culture, the king of pop, and, and what he was as, as a popular figure. It is like, we're going to fucking hang you even after you're dead. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I, I agree to an extent. Um, and I think that my biggest part is, I think that when people make posts, they should put caveats. And I think that a lot of times people post things. But they, it seems so one-sided when in reality, all they have to do is kind of speak to the validity of the other side's argument. Mm-hmm. Um, as black people, we should say we are unfairly um, given, we aren't given a pass. Mm-hmm. And they're, they are trying to destroy these people's legacies. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, we should say, like Morgan Freeman. but guess what? They, they right. Morgan yeah. Freeman, they ain't done with your ass. <laughs> Morgan mm-hmm. Freeman had that twenty seven year old when he was seventy two, and that was like his granddaughter or some stuff. It was some, it was yeah. some weird shit went down with Lil' Morgan too. I mean, it's a lot. I mean, and that's the thing, and I'm just kind of of a, of a mindset that is both things are can be correct. Yeah, Michael Jackson and R. Kelly could both be pedophiles. Yeah, and they can be start trying to destroy black. Like I saw legacy. somebody post, some but shit. don't say it like it's mutually exclusive. Like black people should be should rally to R. Kelly because nah, that's not a fuck that's not a thing nah I'm not doing that and even some people who you know I, I might follow their page or you know their platforms and I agree with them on a lot of things but again and then you know you're getting back to sometimes you know you can be a little bit too you can be blinded over 80 percent yeah on the know, woke scale that's exactly can, what that is you can you can go too far with it like shit black people are not fucking flawless we are the we are um the, the black man is king. All right, you be a damn king and don't pay, <laughs> be a king and don't pay your taxes. They got something for your ass. You know what I'm saying? Be a king and you ain't fucking got no ways to earn no income. Yeah, so you know? it, I mean it's a lot of different things. There. I just I definitely just wanted to get your opinion on that because I think that a lot of people have been talking about that recently, and I'm just like as a as a black man who quote unquote. Use the word woke, and that's that was the last thing I was gonna ask you to define that word woke for me. I just want to know what you think about it. Um, I think just having knowledge yourself, but then that in and of itself is subjective because you can have shit that ain't even fucking true. You know what I'm saying? Like I got posts about the Olmec, which is the original mother civilization of the entire American continent, north, south, and central, and they drew hieroglyphics of themselves on the wall as black people mm-hmm. alongside of so called red people and so called yellow people. You know what I'm saying? And it's like somebody will look at that and be like, "Oh, you you trying to steal 
Mexican culture. And I'm like, nah, motherfucker, we got shit in common. And you're not a damn alien. So who is your real mom and who's your real daddy? You feel me? But then at the same time, you got people who will go and discredit everything that everybody else done and just say, oh, it's black, 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 black. And it's like, I feel like it's a healthy balance. The new To me, the new woke is, yeah, I got knowledge of self. Yeah, I stand for my people, whether that be outspoken or something that's more I keep to myself, but I let my actions speak louder than words. Um, but it got to move beyond that. Like, I'm not running around the motherfucking street hollering about Black Lives Matter because my ancestors already said I'm a human too. Hmm. So my next step is to sock it to these motherfuckers' pocket, you know what I'm saying, and get economic liberation a lot of other ethnic groups of people, like Asians, a lot of them don't even want to be considered minority because they feel like it's a hindrance for their ability to get into schools when you look at certain type of quota programs for, you know, minority, this, that, and the third. And the reason why they do that is because they're not dependent on their oppressor or a person who's who might have an oppressive um, stance towards them becoming as successful as they can be versus with us. A lot of us want to run around and do a whole bunch of hollering and shit, but that's only something that's even necessary because you, I don't give, if I go out here and make my own company, what I'm tripping because you don't hire black folks for. I didn't make my own company that got 500 vacancies that I need to fill. So I'm going to go hire 500 black people. <laughs> the fuck? Which, I know Donald which, Trump. Which which you can't, which he didn't mean literally because yeah. that's kind of, that's kind of illegal. What you mean? Only hire five hundred black folks? <laughs> That's kind of illegal. Shit, I ain't never went unless in them, you unless you make movies. And I ain't everybody's... Never, but let me just be real. I ain't never been in a Mexican restaurant and seen no black folks working. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Possibly. You feel you me? You know, but you know they're gonna have a non um what what do you call it um yeah discriminatory, discriminatory yeah, practices. hiring practices. I mean, like Trump did Straight with up. them people trying to get them people um like housing practices when Trump and his daddy wasn't letting niggas right. in. The, in, in and they develop us in right. New York. so and, and that's what I'm saying. I want to go get that real estate money and shit. If you don't like how I'm doing it, you stay your ass over there. I want to go eat Mexican food. I want to go eat Chinese food. I want to, <laughs> you feel me? I want to damn, I want to do and a whole I wanna, bunch I of want shit. some Chinese people to make it. Listen, uh, <laughs> you did what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, man, look, I hope y'all y'all enjoy really this, um, this midweek drop. I just want to get y'all a little something. I mean, I've been saying we was going to get the Black Packers in here. I'm really a big fan of the movement. Appreciate I'm a fan of what you guys are doing, um, and I just want to let other people know. I mean, like that's kind of what the Best Friend Weekend brand is about to me. Is I want to tell you some things I'm thinking about, and I want y'all to get get down on the shit too. So, like, this is something cool that I, I want other people to get down with. So, if y'all out there support these young brothers, they're really trying to get some cool stuff going. Um, I know a couple of other people who are doing like some travel things, but check in with the Black Packers. They're doing trips too. Uh, maybe we'll link up on some best friend weekend. A weekend when we go out of when we go out of the country. Literally, we gonna uh, we gonna we gonna get with them boys for best friend weekend weekend global, and um, definitely get, look at some merch and doing some different things with that. But uh, TP, tell them a little bit where they can find all of your information, your personal, your business, where they can look you up, um, and where they can find out about your stuff at. Right on. Well, um, you spell it B L A C K P A C K A S. Um, you can use that same handle for Instagram and then the same spelling, B-L-A-C-K-P-A-C-K-A-S.com is the website. Also, we have a, um, a, a YouTube channel. Um, so I got to get a couple more posts back up there just to keep people up to speed on what we got going on. But yeah, just find us there. Um, Instagram, YouTube, and then the website and, you know, don't, don't be bashful. Don't be shy. We regular, you know what I'm saying? Hit me up and, um. We figure out how we can work together or make you a bag or, I mean, whatever. Any, any type of opportunity, just holler at us. All right, man. So, look, we'll catch y'all um, next time. I'll bring y'all some interesting people, talk, have some interesting conversations with some interesting people. So, man, appreciate y'all checking in, checking in with us this week. You know, they say if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. If you can't say something nice. Don't say nothing at all. Nothing nice to say, but I'll go nice. I ain't got nothing, no, no, no. I ain't got nothing, I ain't got nothing nice to say. I ain't got nothing nice to say at all. Nothing nice to say, but I'll go nice. I ain't got nothing, no, no, no. I ain't got nothing nice to say. I ain't got nothing nice to say at all. So I won't say nothing at all. I ain't nothing nice. You hear me?